Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Rocky Minutes at a Com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. Let's discuss Google Stadia, because Kronos Group have accidentally confirmed that we will be seeing the 14nm Vega GPUs tasked to power Google Stadia. Now, there were some rumours that we may see Radeon 7 being used here, but it appears that that isn't the case. And it looks like it's a custom variant of the uh, 14nm first generation Vega parts. Now, it's possible that this could change in the future, of course, especially given the nature of the Stadia platform. But the reason we know it's the first generation Vega and not Radeon 7 is because of conformant products and the Vulkan API. So Kronos, of course, are responsible for the administration and improvement of Vulkan. It is an open standard and so they are a consortium which are responsible for, well, you know, doing it. Um, but the GCN architecture of Vega 7NM is 1.51. Whereas, with the first generation Vega, Vega 14nm, it is 1.5. Which version of GCN that they are listing Google Stadia to be compliant with? That's right, 1.5. The weird thing is, though, that the specifications for Google Stadia is listing 16 gigabytes of memory, as well as up to 484 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth, which is a bit of a head scratcher because if you actually had 16 gigabytes of HBM2, well, in theory anyway, we'd see up to one terabyte per second of memory bandwidth just because of how it's stacked, unless of course they're going with larger DRAM dies or something entirely different that we're just not quite sure of. So another possibility is what they're doing here is listing the amount of memory and bandwidth with uh, the GPU as well as let's say eight gigabytes of memory which is located directly on the motherboard. So one of the awesome things of the Ryzen 3000 series is it would support PCIe 4.0 but better still if you have an older series motherboard such as let's say X470 you can still get PCIe 4.0 to work with backwards compatibility. There are a couple of caveats though. First of all, one of the sources that I first learned Ryzen 3000 would feature PCIe 4.0 indeed. It was an exclusive that we broke that Ryzen 3000 would support PCIe 4.0. Did say that not all motherboards would feature uh, PCIe 4.0 support, that is older motherboards such as let's say X470 or X370. And that's because that they were not produced with PCIe 4.0 in mind. So if you have older, uh, longer traces, you can start to have issues. If they exceed six or seven inches, then basically speaking, the electrical signaling becomes unstable and you simply would not be able to run uh, PCIe 4.0 on that particular slot, on that particular motherboard. But there has been a really cool update for owners of Gigabyte motherboards anyway, and a Redditor by the name of Mvran has discovered that his particular motherboard, which is an X470 Aurorus Gaming Wi-Fi 7, does actually support this particular feature, PCIe 4.0. In the latest BIOS, which is F40, you have PCIe slot configuration auto, Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3, and finally, Gen 4 which is awesome, but there is also better news still because budget-orientated B450 motherboards are also starting to uh, trickle in with reports that, but we have better news still because the cheaper budget-orientated B450 motherboards appear to also support PCIe 4.0 in some cases as well, which is absolutely phenomenal. It's going to be curious to me what differences there are going to be, if any, running a 3000 series CPU on, let's say, an X370 motherboard. Are, are we going to get any differences in, say, memory frequencies? If so, how much of a difference are we going to see? What type of differences are we going to get in PCIe 4.0, for example? Are we going to get any instability 
with the older uh, motherboards if they're running in PCIe 4.0 is there going to be any problems there are we going to get any differences in perhaps stable clock speeds particularly when overclocking it's going to be really cool though and I do love the fact that you can use a Ryzen 3000 series uh, processor in an older board which is really awesome for upgrade paths and you know if you bought let's say a 1600x with a, a B350 motherboard at launch you're going to be really happy with yourself right now especially if the 8 core Matisse CPUs are going to retail at a good price. Now we're going to finish the video off with two Zen 2 powered Rome entries. One is a 32 core 64 thread CPU whereas the other is a monstrous 64 core 128 thread entry. Unfortunately, the 64 core entry has actually been removed from Sisters of Sandra, uh, and while the 32 core version is still up, it's possible obviously it may be removed in the future, so I'm assuming however these leaked, it was less than intentional. What is really interesting though about this is A, the clock frequency, but B, the raw performance of the 64 core part. And it actually was ranking third in arithmetic, which is really impressive. It basically lost out to only two other entries before it was pulled. So let's start things out with the specs of the 64 core processor. 64 cores, 128 threads. Most of the information though can be discerned from the code name. What we have is ZX1406E. 2VJUG5 underscore 22 slash 14 underscore N. So the 22 and the 14 actually represent the clock frequency. 22 equals 2200 megahertz for the turbo. 14 equals the base frequency or 1.4 gigahertz if you prefer. Z though is also telling us a lot of information because Z represents the fact that it is a qualification sample CPU. I'm gonna, before we dissect that any further though, let's move down to the 32 core processor. So this particular processor, the entry can still be found and it is 32 cores, 64 threads. So it's the same number of cores and threads as what the current Epic CPUs uh, go up to. So the name for the CPU is ZS, so the Z obviously represents the fact that it is indeed, you guessed it, a qualification sample. So ZS1711E3VIVG5, wow these names just roll right off the tongue don't they, 24 slash 17N. So this particular processor uh, as you probably may have guessed from the name, runs at 2.4 gigahertz, uh, that's what the 24 represents in the code name, with a base frequency of 1.7 gigahertz. So the interesting thing about this particular result, uh, first of all it's a qualification sample, at least going by uh, the decoder, uh, but it's actually a slower clock frequency than what Epic runs at, the 7601 actually has a base frequency of 2.2 gigahertz, which is almost the same clock frequency as the 32 core 64 thread part. Uh, so what we have also knowledge of is the fact that uh, the level three cache here is confirmed to be double that of uh, the first generation Epic. So the first generation Epic has 64 megabytes, whereas this particular part is listed as 128 megabytes of level three cache which is gargantuan because we don't have TDP information it makes it a lot harder to know whether or not these CPUs are for a specific lower power environment so for example because they are qualification sample processors retail sample CPUs probably won't have much higher clock frequencies but they could be a qualification sample of a set of CPUs which is once again designed for lower clock frequencies because the environment that it's going to be operating in doesn't require high clock frequencies all it requires is an awful lot of CPU cores so that's my guess here is that especially in the case of the 32 core part AMD were not shooting to produce a, a, a CPU that had 
really high clock frequencies. Instead, it was producing a CPU for a specific target market. In other words, a decent number of CPU cores, uh, a great amount of I.O., and we know that obviously Rome does have great I.O., but the clock frequencies are lower so that it doesn't eat up so much energy, which can be really handy in certain data, uh, data center usage scenarios. I have been told by one source that AMD are targeting a set of SKUs which have 64 cores to run at at least the same clock frequencies that current generation Epic CPUs, but at the end of the day, the source could be wrong. My personal feeling is though that most likely we will see clock frequencies that are going to be higher than this, but I do think that these are low power CPUs. But obviously all we can do now is wait and see. With all of that said though, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you did, well, you can like and share the video because that helps us out a ton. And you can also subscribe to the channel and get us over 62,000 subscribers. And I'd also like to take a moment to thank you all for, well, actually getting us to 62,000 subscribers. With all of that said, take care of yourselves and have a great day. Bye for now.